All right, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for having me down, um, University of Illinois Extension and um, the Soil Health Collaborative here in Joe Davies County. Um, great day to be down here in Illinois. I am originally from Northern Illinois. I grew up in a small town in Walnut, Illinois, about an hour and a half south of here, went to Elizabeth many times on the way to University of Wisconsin, Platteville, where I majored in soil crop science and ag business, and then went on to UW Madison, where I work today as a Southwest Regional Groundman. So, very frequent visitor to the Driftless region. So we're going to cover tillage economics, and this is definitely not an anti-tillage talk um, or a pro-tillage talk, but we're going to cover all aspects of tillage, give you guys something to think about. How many farmers do we have in the audience today? Show of hands. And the balance is agronomists, conservation professionals. Accurate? Go if I killed the thing already. <laughs> all right, so I killed the whole thing. Okay, so we can make this work. So start off with a few pictures. Most of my slides are pictures. I am a visual learner myself. I stole this photo from Frederick Larson on Twitter. Um, this is why we're here today. A lot of erosion in the driftless region. Our slopes anywhere from six to twelve percent are good fields. Our tougher fields are anywhere from eighteen to twenty-five percent. Anything above twenty-five percent is where things start to tip over. Um, I have a farmer I work with near Dodgeville, Wisconsin. I said. Um, I was working with them on a nutrient management plan and some soil planning, and I said, they're tipping it over on some of these fields. He says, oh yeah. I said, well, that explains why you're farming 40% slopes. So possible to farm some steeper fields in southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois, but um, gets a little more hazardous. So you can see that we got down to the um, rocky layer, that soil, we washed out the best soil down towards the, the farmer's vehicle there in that photo. Um, and, and probably a lot of that went on behind that into a little bit of a creek. Um, tillage economics matter because there is times when we need to do some tillage, and that's when we have some compaction layers. The photo up here shows a compaction layer near Monroe, Wisconsin. Um, did a soil pit on that farm with a coworker of mine, and the farmer was growing continuous silage corn and having manure applications in a full tillage system and was concerned about compaction. He definitely had some out in that field, um, and we provided some remedies on how to deal with that. And then, of course, um, our silage production field, we're going to cover that in a little more detail today. How many folks are growing either corn silage or hay, either baled or chopped? Yeah, a few producers here today. That's great. Uh, we'll dive into that and the compaction struggles of forage production in a little bit as well. The final photo is actually corn rootworm damage, but it demonstrates how important those roots are and how quickly the roots can be damaged from compaction. Okay, so tillage economics. Um, the soil itself, we can't control everything over here. Our sand, clay, um, and loam comp composition, we can't control that. However, the second chart, we can control the organic matter to a little bit of an extent, maybe a percentage or two. We can control how much air and how much water is in our soil through our crop and production practices. Again, to a certain percentage. We can't control how much it rains. We can't control how much um, our soil natively holds for those things but we influence those things. This is a photo that's on pretty flat ground. This is my foot in the photo. This is a soybean field that we disked and we we're gonna plant corn on. This was in uh, 2018. We had a little bit later planting year that year. So this is June one or so. And you can see that soil start to wash off of this fairly flat field. Again, pretty close to a tabletop flatness, but it's still washing away. We're losing our minerals and there's a cost to that we'll cover in a few slides. This is really important to think about. Really important to think about because this is a, the best soil on our farm is able to leave through water movement, some through wind movement. Um, and then of course, that's gonna have a huge impact on our yield overall and the soil health. So this is a photo of rhizobia bacteria, um, making that soil cling to the roots of an alfalfa plant that's, my, uh, that's uh, scaled up about 50 times. Um, through a lens, and we think about how many billions of microbes are in that soil that we're losing potentially through erosion. It's a nice demonstration we did this summer, um, just north of here, about 20 miles in southern Lafayette County. Um, we did a runoff simulator on a farm. Has everybody seen a runoff simulator? A few. So a runoff simulator simulates um, a set amount of precipitation and a set amount of time 
over slabs of earth that were cut out um, of a field. And I say earth because they're taking the biomass, they're taking corn stalks, they're taking soil, everything that's in say a one meter area gets cut out, gets put in a pan, and then it gets a simulated amount of rain um, precipitated over that soil. So these are the different crops that this farm had um, and a couple, couple of neighbors had. Um, and again, this is set at about a 6% slope. So you can change the slope to, to influence that amount of runoff that's occurring. The first one here um, that we wanna look at is everything below the red line is bad. That would be runoff. So it would be running into the creeks, it would be running into the roads, that'd be running into your neighbor's field or even moving soil from one side of your field to the other. The top is good. So you wanna have those buckets filled up as much as possible because that's infiltration. That's water that we can use later on in the season. That's water that's being filtered before it gets to the groundwater. Our first one, we have continuous corn, no-till system, direct plant um, into that heavy biomass, that stock layer um, with manure being applied annually. Quite a bit of infiltration there for no-till continuous corn. That one surprised us quite a bit. Not a lot ran off. We had cool season grass pasture. This is oftentimes considered the Cadillac of systems. Um, we had a lot of infiltration there um, into that um, particular one with not much running off. Um, again, long-term rotation of grazed. The second one um, was corn soybean rotation, fall chisel plowed and spring tilled before you plant the corn um, or before you plant soybeans and then just spring cultivation before the soybeans were planted not much infiltrated. So this is where we see that infiltration really start to take a hit. Um, in these systems, we see a lot of tillage, we're removing that air, making it harder to get water into that um, infiltration layer. Move on, we had soybeans. Um, on this particular field, it was a corn, corn soybean rotation, no-till, and one year of cover crops. Quite a bit of infiltration. Again, this was a second surprise of this study was um, we have a little bit more infiltration here than we expected, especially since that cover crop had only been out there for a few months. So that roots, those living roots are already helping us there. The final one was kind of a mixed um, bag. We had alfalfa grass um, where we had four years of hay harvested and then four years of silage corn harvested for an eight-year rotation. Um, No-till system, cover crops and manure, um, about 50% um, infiltrated, about 50% ran off. But again, pretty challenging system when you're harvesting that much forage. Um, off of those fields. Not always easy to get the timing of that correctly when the soil is dry enough to support the equipment. Um, this is my father-in-law's farm uh, near Madison, Wisconsin. And you can think about how much water runs off these fields to have that waterway. That waterway, my pickup sitting down here when I took this photo with the drone, that waterway is about 60 feet wide. And it's pretty common for that much water to flow through there. He's been no-tilling continuously for six years. So we're still losing a lot of water off of the farm, even though it's a continuous notes of the system. When he was tilling, um, he said they often had to redo those waterways very frequently because of the amount of sediment that would run off those fields. All right, so conventional tillage. Again, um, this is neither pro or anti-tillage talk, even though there's gonna be a few slides that make all of us wonder if it is or not. Conventional tillage for definition terms is when we do fall tillage followed by um, a spring finisher pass. Um, again, it could be a, a pretty aggressive. This is moldboard plowing this fall up in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. This is Arlington Prairie Soils um, near Arlington, Wisconsin, uh, doing some fall disc ripping. And then this is south of here. This is at home um, with the field finisher on some pretty nice prairie soils that needs to be drained swamp. Um, conservation tillage then. Um, I actually looked up this definition because I don't think it's no tillage, conservation tillage, but oftentimes it's thrown around together. Um, conservation tillage is any time when we're no-tilling, strip-tilling, ridge-tilling, or mulch-tilling on the soil. We're not going to cover these three. Um, I did see some strip-tillage on the way down. If you guys want more information on strip-tillage, other than what's going to be provided today, Josh Camps, the Lafayette County Ag Educator for the University of Wisconsin, has been strip-tilling for many years, and so is his dad. He'd be a great speaker um, on strip-till. Um, this is our, our no-till planter that we use um, in the dripless region for our experimental work. It's very simple. It doesn't need to be complicated when you're no-till planter. It's a 1984 white planter. Um, all that's been done to it to optimize it for no-till is it's got these spike halters on the back, one spike halter, one rubber tire um, closing wheel. It's very effective at what it does. It works really well when the ground conditions are great. 
because it doesn't have hydraulic down pressure, it doesn't have any of the rigorous seeding techniques, that type of thing. Um, but if the conditions are well um, fit for planting, it does a great job. A lot of strip till occurs in Wisconsin. Is anybody strip tilling in the crowd today? Yeah, one strip tiller. Um, great system, allows you to get best of both worlds and allows you to replace some nutrients. You place some nutrients when you strip till. Yeah, perfect. So it allows you to manage some nutrients at the same time. Um, it's a pretty um, innovative system. So why till and why not? A lot of these are gonna be the same. We're gonna dive into yield data here in a few slides, even though I really don't like data slides. We're not gonna cover some yield data. Um, higher yields, if you ask no-tillers and folks that till, um, they till or no-till for the same purpose, higher yields in the system. I have the data to support that later on. Um, optimum soil moisture at planting, this is why my grandfather tills along with some root control issues. Um, it allows soil to dry out, allows for a great planting bed, allows you to plant at eight, 10 miles an hour for large planters. Very important maybe in some of our fields, especially south of here. However, no-till is gonna retain that moisture year-round a little bit better. I have the data to show you on that as well. Pest control, um, tillage is gonna help us with some pest control issues. Um, however, no-till is really good at helping us control weed because it allows the weed seeds to break down on the surface. Every time you till your field, when you have weeds out there, you're burying those weed seeds. That's a good thing. However, when you do spring tillage, you bring those weed seeds back up to the top, they're allowed to germinate. That's why you get that nice flush of weeds every time you do a construction project, you mound up the soil to build a house, that type of thing. Velvet leaf seeds can live in the soil for many years. So that's why you see those growing on top of the mound of soil. If they're left undisturbed, you may never see those weed seeds. Uh, residue management, this is huge. Um, our corn hybrids produce a lot of residue. Residue takes a long time to break down. I've never talked to a no-till farmer in Wisconsin though that complains about his residue. So I think this is a challenge that we can easily overcome. Um, compaction on both sides. Um, we do some heavy tillage to take out compaction. We'll show some slides here in a little bit that shows that the first pass after that primary tillage puts in more till, more compaction than potentially what we had previously if the conditions aren't fit when you're back out there in the field. Um, very little surface compaction in no-till fields. Um, have you guys done a soil pit as part of the soil health group yet? Yeah. You often see that compaction layer even in long-term no-till fields from that field cultivator pass 30 years ago when it was a little too wet. Pretty tough to get rid of that, but eventually no-till does help um, allow the roots to grow a little bit easier through that, where strip-till may have its place. Um, reduced pesticide use because, of course, we're um, working up the soil, getting rid of the weeds, and reducing pesticide runoff because that soil incorporating those herbicides or any other um, pesticides that we might be using throughout the season. Um, and then lower management level. Um, it's much easier to go out and field pollinate the field in the spring and plant corn or soybeans into that than having to go through a no-till planter modification process or adjusting the planter for every soil type you have on the farm. But again, I've never heard anyone complain that um, their planter is just too complicated to be able to make it. Uh, and then finally wrap up the no-till side, um, reduce machinery costs, fuel, and saves time. So this is where it really helps um, on the, the budget side of things is you don't need to own an $80,000 disc ripper, a $300,000 tractor to pull the disc ripper, um, and then all the, the finishing equipment for the spring. Reduce soil erosion and nutrient loss. So whenever we lose soil, we lose phosphorus and potassium. The phosphorus and potassium are tied to the soil. That's really important, especially in the dripless region. We see a lot of phosphorus leave farms um, in southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, via soy road. All right, so um, a, a, the first of a few complicated charts, but we're going to just break this down. First off, I use tillage costs a lot versus tillage um, expenses. So I looked up the definition for costs. This is a one time investment. You can have gains or losses on that investment. An expense is just annually. Annually, we buy seed, we buy diesel, we buy um, tires for our vehicles, that type of thing. The cost would be buying a no-till planter, buying the disc ripper, um, applying uh, phosphorus for a two-year rotation, that type of thing. So this is the estimated crop residue levels remaining on the field. The more residue, the better for the soil and the better for the environment. The more challenging the system is to crop it. However, those challenges, again, aren't impossible to overcome. 
Um, this is a book that I use quite a bit, uh, Building Better Soils from SARE, um, Building Soils for Better Crops. This just came out a couple months ago. Um, really good book. It's a free PDF online. I, I recommend it. I didn't realize the value of this publication until I started really putting some time into this presentation. And there's a lot of details in there that I'd recommend reading. So after harvest, we have about 95% of the soil covered by corn residue or wheat residue. So the soil is pretty much covered, ready for winter, ready to plant a cover crop into, that type of thing. After soybeans, um, it's 60 to 80%. And I would argue it's probably 50 to 60% on some years with some varieties of soybeans. It seems like we see a lot of soil um, showing after soybeans. And that's really prone to soil loss. So our soybeans are our toughest system to grow in the driftless region because they're most prone to soil loss. Um, after winter, we break down a little bit of that residue, maybe 10, 15%. And then we can start to look at some tillage. Um, what we're plowing really reduces that residue down to 10% for corn for a high, 5% for soybeans. Our chisels, it uh, depends on what kind of points we have. I think everybody's probably running mostly straight points, 68%, 40, 60%. Um, and then our disc plow, our, our disc rippers, we, um, reduce that by a little bit less than the chisel, a lot less than the mower plow. And then if we would just field cultivate that residue again, we're not really doing a whole lot. You got spring finisher pass, uh, reducing that by again, 30 to 40%. And then our row crop planter, so this would be a no-till planting. Um, we still have 85 to 95% of the corn residue out in the field, or 60 to 70% of the soybean residue out in the field after we introduce composition. So what's that residue really valuable for? But he can shout it out. It looks like you know the green shirt. Yeah. Oh, it keeps moisture. It's moisture. Exactly. It helps hold the moisture in the soil, keeps the soils cooler, but not too cool. And it really helps reduce weed seeds from Germany. That mulch is very valuable. Um, we'll talk about the value of that mulch in a few slides. Um, tillage costs and soil organic matter. This is a publication from Iowa State University, um, tillage management and organic matter, um, looking at that organic matter breakdown. So on the bottom of the chart, we have our annual residue. So think about the corn and soybean residue, 85 to 95% corn residue on the soil surface. At harvest, that's on the bottom in tons per acre, anywhere from zero to five tons. And then we have our soil organic matter, organic carbon. Um, so we're gonna talk about carbon sequestration later today. It's going to be a very important component is having this crop residue left out there. And you can see as our residue volume goes up, we're able to have a little bit more soil organic carbon out there. If you think about the long term impacts of this, eventually we're going to plateau on soil organic matter in the Midwest. However, a lot of times our soils are, are already pretty well depleted. We have plenty of room to grow those, maybe a percentage point or two. So when you think about leaving that residue, that has a huge impact also has a huge impact when you start looking at soil loss. You start to consider soil loss, that residue is a very big impact, as is the disturbance factor and the slope. Um, so another chart from this publication from Iowa State University and the supporting paper that goes um, along with that. Um, we look at this first chart here. This is soil organic matter, um, carbon uh, for no-till systems, strip till, um, chisel plow, disc, uh, moldboard disc rip, moldboard plow. Um, and then the two increments that are commonly measured are zero to six inches, so standard soil test, and then six to 12 inch sample, which would be um, not so much of a standard test, but one that we would just do for research. And then this is soil organic carbon per ton, uh, tons per acre. I um, mean, you can see how that no-till system really um, thrives at that carbon per acre um, in the top six inches. And then it does level off, it's more comparable to strip till and more comparable to chisel plow in that next layer. Um, but again, we think about this as over time. So we, 100, 200 years ago, there was a set amount of soil carbon in our soils that would be illustrated by this chart. And then as soon as we start tilling that soil, we had that carbon go down. We completed that organic map. So if you pull a soil sample from a forested area, an area around a stream um, that hasn't been disturbed, an area in a fence row even, you can see that soil organic matter percentage be quite a bit higher, maybe 10% on some of our really good soils, where our field is maybe two and a half to three and a half percent. So we've depleted that, it's gonna be very difficult to get that back. I'm not here to sell, trying to get any of that back, but again, we can start building that or sequestering carbon 
if we stop disturbing the soil. It takes a long time to get that back. So again, nothing to really worry about. Um, so we have a really good, great program in Wisconsin. SNAP Plus is our nutrient management planning software. Um, and it, it really helps us look at these variables on a landscape scale and on a farm scale. So we can import our field data, our crop data, our tillages, our yields, and then start to run um, some models through SNAP Plus to help us make plans for nutrient management planning and help us find areas of our farm that are losing soil and phosphorus. So this is a, a, a field at Arlington, Wisconsin, fairly flat field, plano silt loam to two to six percent slope. It's a continuous corn silage system, no-till with a three-year rotation. So that means there was just three years of data imported into this. Doesn't mean that there's three different variables because it's just all corn silage. Liquid dairy manure was applied at 12,000 gallon per acre and then winter rye cover crop was planted September 20th. This isn't just a simulation we ran, this is an actual field that's managed this way at the Arlington Research Farm. My coworker Kevin Shelley um, manages that field for a long-term study on winter rye with dairy manure. On the no cover crop fields, again, this is two to 6% slope. This field looks flatter than many of the fields I saw driving down, fairly flat. We had on our no cover crop fields, we had 4.7 tons per acre and we had a phosphorus index of five. In Wisconsin annually, we have to have our phosphorus index under 12 and over the course of our rotation, it has to be under six. So we're almost hitting our six there for this rotation. Once we incorporate a winter rye cover crop, plant it on September 20th. Planting day is really important. Even though we can't plant winter rye, even today, we could go out and plant winter rye and we could have a viable cover crop in most cases next spring. It wouldn't be good over winter. It wouldn't come up, obviously. We had 1.7 tons per acre of soil loss, so we're still losing soil. Yes. For the uh, rye in this rotation, is that terminated uh, different grain of corn from the corn in, or is it a uh, harder to have crop? Great question, both. So they, for this particular slide, I believe Kevin's harvesting it, but he does have fields where he leaves it, plants into. He does kill it before he plants into it. He's been doing this for 10 years before planting green really became an adopted practice, um, but excellent question. So this slide, we would assume that the rye is pretty much gone at planting time. Um, so we get the, the soil erosion down to 1.7 tons per acre and our PI index down to two. So a sustainable level for phosphorus index. We're still having a cost for that soil loss, but again, for a dairy forage system, we're pretty happy with that. So tillage cost, another study. Um, this one is from Nebraska. Um, I stole this one from um, the No-Till Farmer magazine. They've got a book that has a lot of this information in it. Um, not an endorsement for the magazine, but if you want to learn more about other farmers no-tilling, um, it does seem to have some really interesting articles in it. Um, so this is crop residue. Um, soil loss is compared uh, to different tillage systems. So we look at the bottom of the chart, no-till planting. In their study, they had 38% um, soil residue out there, um, seven-tenths of a ton of soil loss, so still almost 1,000 pounds, 700 pounds, and then 91% um, reduction from volume. So this is an older study from the University of Nebraska. But if we look at this data um, and we compare the chisel plow to the no-till systems, we are assuming that the soil has a nutrient value of two pounds of nitrogen, nine pounds of plant available phosphorus or PQO5, and three pounds of plant available potassium or KQO per ton of soil. That's an assumption for this particular model. You can find that data in the literature. It's a little bit variable, but it's fairly consistent. Um, this nutrient credit here per ton is pretty similar to finding box manure out of a beef feedlot. It's good nutrient value, and that's per ton. So that's something that we can lose. Full tillage loses two and a half tons per acre for $17 lost in nutrients besides their tillage costs. We'll dive into the actual tillage costs. So here's the economic spend. We'll dive into the economic side. $17 of lost nutrients, lost potential. Um, that's in today's dollars. So at 91 cents for nitrogen and 50 cents for um, phosphorus and potassium are the prices I found recently. I have heard that those numbers are actually a little conservative. Our no-till planting still lost seven tenths of a ton per acre for nine dollars a lot of nutrients, but it's about half. So we are saving, we're helping to recoup some of those costs of no-till. So what about soil compaction? Um, everybody wants to till because of soil compaction. 
it's a very valid reason to use tillage on our farms. Um, this is um, what I'm going to call recreational tillage. Um, my wife makes fun of me now when I say, wow, they're really doing some pretty aggressive recreational tillage. But um, whenever you're disc ripping soybean ground in the winter, that's an interesting approach um, to managing your soil long term. Um, if that, that's a strategy to remove compaction, there's probably some other options we should explore as well. Um, this is obviously an old Glenco chisel. We're putting out a field experiment on long term rotations using tillage and winter rye. Um, but we do see soil movement every year in this study. This field is perfectly flat. We believe that at Lancaster Agricultural Research Station. It's a very nice field for research in the Driftless region. Um, a, another photo of Grandpa um, out there. Um, and think about the amount of compaction that is probably going back into that soil with the 650 horsepower tractor on the nice mellow soil. So this is where um, things get really interesting. Dr. Brian Luck is a um, associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus, and he's done a lot of work with compaction. And this is um, from his recent paper with a graduate student um, using a, a drone to look at NDVI values, so the amount of light reflected from alfalfa, basically taking an aerial image and looking at the percent green versus not green, or various shades of green of an alfalfa field. So this first photo is taken at seeding. So you can see where the drill went, every direction, you know, every little skip they had with the, with the drill. It's probably a three or four inch strip is what the actual red lines represent. Um, not much um, compaction out there. However, when they started harvesting that, this is after the fourth harvest, after a year of harvesting that field. So this would be the second year of the crop. You can see that alfalfa really get beat up everywhere they drove the trucks on this field to harvest. If you think about the amount of cost, that that has in the forage value. So they actually did that. They actually crunched the numbers. And for um, single pass silage, their yield was six and a half tons per acre. After five passes of silage, their yield was not significantly different. So there was some variation in there. It means there are some yields that overlap with the single pass and the fourth crop harvest. However, it was still 5.8 tons per acre. So you still lost a little bit of yield, but again, not statistically different. But what's really surprising is when you look at five passes of hay, three passes of hay is at 5.8, five is 5.7 compared to where they didn't drive on it at all and they went in and hand harvested it just to the check. Hand harvesting forage is not a lot of fun. Um, seven and a half tons of silage corn or of, of silage hay. So you know, imagine the economic value, $300 a ton, $400 a ton for really good quality alfalfa or Decent quality hay, $200 a ton. Pretty substantial, three or $400 an acre loss there. But again, it's, nece it's a necessity to go in there and harvest it. So how can we avoid it? We need proper tires on our equipment. Harvest when it's not really wet. Delaying harvest or harvesting a little bit early to avoid those rain events. Or thinking about the establishment methods because the first tire that goes across every section of the field Dr. Luck has some really good slides on this as well, is where the most compaction occurs. So you can actually see where every tire went across that field with different images that his lab has collected because that compacts the most and has the most impact on yield. So you do some controlled traffic, drive in the same area of the field, try and get off the hay field and into one of those controlled lanes as quick as possible. Think about tires on the harvesting equipment, not so much the chopper, but everything else. And also think about um, no-till planting those forages, just so you don't have that really fluffy soil that's so easy to compact. All right, so soil compaction management. Um, I knew that this would be um, the most controversial sticking point in the talk was, we're gonna talk about reducing tillage, we're gonna have to think about compaction. Surface level compaction, um, surface seal or crust compaction. These are summaries. Um, this is not necessarily um, the only place you can find these, this information. But you're going to see with that surface resi residue, um, compaction, poor seeding, emergence, accelerated runoff and erosion, pretty common in the driftless region. However, it's because we're tilling, we're compacting that top layer. So if we stop tilling, we hopefully will get rid of that surface crusting. Um, in our no-till study, we never have an issue with crusting. Um, our surface layer compaction, it's a little bit deeper. That's when we see wheel tracks out in the field from unfortunate wet harvests or sprayer passes that occur when it's a little too wet out. Um, when we have standing water out in the field that's not normally there, 
when it's hard to dig, so take a spade out in your field, really easy way to look through the compacted areas or um, a penetrometer, which for everyone in the room can be um, a, a tile probe, works very well. That's what I prefer. The, the commercial available penetrometers with the dial really don't tell you much. You can do a lot by feel. Um, this is where we're going to use um, a little bit of strip tillage, incorporate some different crops into our rotation, have different roots grow through that soil profile and help break up that compaction. Um, try and build organic matter, use controlled traffic. And subsoil is where we're going to think about doing some deep tillage um, with strip tiller, a deep ripper. However, remember, every time we disturb the soil, the next pass is going to be the one that puts the most compaction back into that. So if we have subsurface compaction, we find with that penetrometer, that tile probe, um, maybe appropriate. But again, think about how much compaction it really has to be. Um, this is when we see the roots really struggling to grow. This is not when we go out and we dig up roots in the summertime and they're cupped or they're really struggling to break through the next layer. That would be up here in that surface layer compaction, the subsoil. That's 18 to 20 inches deep. It's where we're going to start to bring up rocks if we get to the all right, water infiltration. This was a, a topic that uh, Philip wanted me to cover and dive into. First, an example. So 220 bushel of corn, that takes 616,000 gallons of water to raise. One acre inch is 27,154 gallons of water. So that means we need to apply either through rain, um, this shouldn't say gallons, it should say inches, 22.68 inches of precipitation. Lancaster Research Farm last year had 18 inches of precipitation. Guessing that's pretty similar, maybe even a little bit less if we go farther east of here. Um, a little bit below average year, we can still have plenty of water to grow our crop. So why do we see drought stress sometimes? Because our soil is no longer holding onto that soil. We've gone four to six weeks without rain. The crop's struggling because we've depleted all that moisture out of the soil through spring um, aggressive tillage techniques sometimes, or because our soil properties just don't inherently hold as much water as we'd like them to. So if we look at the, the summarized data chart here, um, sill loam soil, this is a percent of plant available water capacity. Um, our, our plow fields hold about 24% water. Our no-till holds 28%, so we see a 17% increase. Think about 17% increase of, of water holding capacity, that might get us through a four week dry spell that occurs in early July or late August. It's not gonna be enough to overcome the corn and water needs of pollination time, but it might help us maintain yield a little bit more. And again, we have this for different soil types as well. So what about the costs of um, soil health and soil health practices? This is a, another chart. Um, we're near the end of this chart that I lifted from the Building Soils for Better Crops publication, but I know this one had some really interesting data on it. And it was comparing plow fields to no-till fields. So maybe not as applicable to what we're doing in, in Northern Illinois and Southern Wisconsin, but gives us something to think about. We have our aggregate stability, very important factor. It's almost double for no-till fields compared to plow. Um, both densities fairly comparable. Um, the penetration resistance, 140 versus 156. So we see that higher on no-till fields. However, if you take your spade out and dig in a no-till field, that's where you're gonna see that aggregate, aggregate, <laughs> aggregate stability number allow you to dig a little bit easier into that soil and have a little more soil tilt compared to your uh, fields. Permeability, um, a little bit of an increase. Plant available water holding capacity, a pretty good increase. And then water infiltration. Has anyone seen the infiltration test done? Um, there's various ways to do those. Some are more scientific than others. Um, however, we want that water to infiltrate into the soil eventually. I've seen fields where we've, we've done some of these trials where the water really slowly infiltrates into the, into the ground. And that's really not what we want. Um, this is really interesting. This is um, something I found pretty interesting, the chemical properties. Early season available nitrates was 13 pounds per acre for um, plow versus 20 for no-till. So we have an eight pound difference there. That's pretty substantial, it's about $4 per acre. We're doing absolutely nothing. Um, times that by a um, thousand acres and it's pretty easy to pay for, I guess, about two thirds or, or even half of a pickup right now. But um, phosphorus, 20 and 21 pounds, that much difference. But then remember phosphorus and calcium are gonna leave the soil. If we see soil erosion, they're gonna be tied onto the soil product particles. Um, potassium, a little bit of an increase, manganese and calcium. Um, we don't worry about those much in the dripless region with our near parent material. 
pH, um, a little bit different. Again, this is out in New York. So when we see no-till systems in the dripless region, we typically see pH changes a little bit, depending on what fertilizer sources we're using and how we're managing our nitrogen. Biological activity was pretty interesting. Plowed had 4% organic matter versus 5.4. In southern Wisconsin, I've seen this be 2.3 for tilled ground versus 3.5 or 3.7 for the long-term yield fields. Pretty substantial difference when you look at the value of organic matter that we're not going to cover as extensively as we could today. Um, and then some other factors that we think about through soil health testing. Um, soil health, some of the key factors here is our soil cover. Um, this is what influences the soil organic matter, the organ, organism habitat. Um, we want the soil cover to be out there year round if possible, either through residue or through cover crops, that way to support that microbial life and to help build that soil residue. Um, residue breakdown is going to be the job of the microbes in for no longer tilling. And those microbes will way outnumber us in just one cup of soil for everyone on, on, on the earth. It's really incredible how many microbes are out in the soil. Um, and then there's some other factors there, again, for the sense of time, I think we're going to keep on moving. But really important factors, and we can all have a huge impact on these depending on how we're managing the soil. So then the cost of soil health continue to wrap this up. I'm going to move over to this other slide um, just for the sake of time. And you can see practices that improve soil health versus reduce soil health. Anything to do with tillage um, is going to be reducing soil health. It's going to be disturbing the microbes. It's going to be helping break down that residue much quicker, um, destroying that habitat and destroying that soil carbon that we want to try and hold in the soil. Compaction is going to be lessened actually long-term no-till. Um, that's really the surprising factors if you go into some of the long-term no-till fields. There's some really great soil in these fields. Um, it's hard, hard to describe in, in the conference room today, but if you take a, a spade out into your no-till, strip-till fields and dig the soil compared to um, a neighbor's full disc um, chisel plow system, there's a big difference. Um, and then cover crops can have a huge impact. Rotation length, if we're growing continuous corn with continuous tillage, there's really not going to be a lot of life out there in that soil, unfortunately, and that soil is going to be very prone to loss. Uh, we're growing a corn, soybean, wheat, and alfalfa rotation. You're going to have many different roots to support the soil life and to help soil that soil in place. All right. Um, Ted Bay is a retired Lafayette and Grant County Extension Educator, and I asked him to do this talk about five years ago at a uh, health, soil health day we were doing in Iowa County. He put together these slides. I thought they were worth bringing back out for today. I get to have lunch with Ted in a couple of weeks. He's a, a great um, econo economic uh, number cruncher for Southern Wisconsin farmers. If we look at the cost of adopting no-till on a farm in Southern Wisconsin. According to Ted, we can see increases in herbicide because of course, we're not tilling that first pass. We're gonna put down a pre-emergent herbicide. We're gonna have some costs there. Um, interest on operating capital, he says that's gonna increase um, because of some potential factors we've covered in a few slides. However, we're going to see decreases in repair, fuel, and labor because we're not working that ground anymore. And we're going to see decreases in either depreciation or ownership costs for our equipment overall. This is a photo Ted took. Ted um, really was a good photographer as well as an extension educator. This is a winter rye plant. So that's a winter rye seed. That winter rye plant's about the size of our pinky finger. And that's on a 12% sloped field in Crawford County. Um, this was vertically tilled planted right in the surface. Um, this is um, dimes stacked up. There's four to five dimes stacked up there. And if you look in the literature, every dime, if you lose a dime thickness of soil across an acre, is anywhere from four to seven tons, depending on whose paper you're reading. So you can think about the soil loss there on that particular little square foot of field is pretty substantial with that rye root is standing fully in place. So you know that value of that root holding that soil in place is pretty substantial. Um, again, think about that rye seeds about the size of a pencil eraser um, holding that much soil in place. And all the way around that plant, if you look at that photo on your computer, is eroded away. All right, so what will change with no-till? Yield's a big question. I've got my last few slides on yield data. Um, so we're going to skip ahead to those, but yield's our biggest impactor. Who thinks we're going to lose yield in step Show your hand. Nobody's brave today. It's like when you ask the audience who has water. 
Wouldn't it be somewhat dependent on how long it's been no deal? Exactly. Great point. Exactly. <laughs> if it's just one of the first year, you're going to see a decrease. If it's three, four years, you'll start to see that maintain or build back. Excellent point from the audience. Who has water hemp, by the way? No, I don't want to that. Everybody has water hemp. Um, all right, so this is Ted's final slide on the economics um, of no-till. And Ted says there's no change in yield, and Ted has the data to support that, as we do have the data from Lancaster Research Farm. After three years, that yield's going to come back up. You're seeing that yield jump up with tillage every year because you're getting a nice flush of that nitrogen. You're getting a nice control of the weeds initially, and that soil is really nice at planting time. However, long term, you're depleting all that. Reduce tillage costs. You can sell the tillage equipment or you can rent it to a neighbor or you can just keep it for that day that um, grandpa or dad's gonna say that we need to till again. Um, it's gonna save you $46 per acre. Um, my grandpa's not gonna go with his tillage equipment anytime soon. Net change, um, but he says he's gonna no-till corn into soybean ground next year. Um, I will take bets on that after the program. Net changes is $46 uh, minus our $15 is $31 an acre if we hold on to the tillage equipment. Um, so that's $46,000 annually. I used to say, whenever I talked about numbers that large in a farming system, we go buy a new pickup. Unfortunately, we couldn't buy a new pickup today if we wanted to, nor um, could we get one for $46,000, but think about what you could do with that. Go on vacation, pay for soil testing, um, pay for college for um, your grandkids or your children, that type of thing. Um, but there are a few additional costs, increased herbicide costs. That, that really, that number I think is still variable. It depends on the weed species. No-till, I, I do see a lot of winter annuals and perennials starting to overwinter in some of the newer no-till fields we have. However, we're seeing some really big reductions in water. We think that's going to translate to palmer amaranth if that ever becomes a huge problem. Planting cost is a little bit more. So this is some data that we've been collecting from Lancaster Research Farm. About five minutes, Philip. Perfect. Um, and this is different systems that we have. We have conventional till, we have no-till, we have cover crops where we terminate them two weeks before we plant. So the old recommendations for the USDA crop insurance program, no longer accurate. Um, we have a system where we plant green. So very popular right now, especially some producers who go farther towards the lake in Wisconsin. We have a forage harvest component. So harvesting that winter rye at boot stage for forage or about knee high. And then we have our late termination where we just simply go out plant green and wait two weeks to spray. So that's also an interesting system, especially for corn grain. For weed control, you can see all those numbers and letters are about the same. Um, statistically, they're all pretty much the same, except for um, our early termination compared to our late termination timing. But again, that's irrelevant for today's talk. We get excellent weed control in corn with winter rot. These are circled because we start to see that variation. This is where we introduce a pre-emergent herbicide into the system. So wherever we see that data at the very top of the graph, that's where we see a, a pre-emergent herbicide introduced into the system. And our pre-emergent herbicides do a great job in all these systems. They're especially valuable for water hemp, especially valuable in tillage systems where we see those wheat seeds germinate two weeks after tillage. That soil warms up. Um, soybeans, excellent weed control for cover crops. So that's the whole take home of this slide. Excellent weed control for no-till systems as well. Incorporate a pre-emergent herbicide into that. You have outstanding weed control. Our challenges of managing water hemp, giant ragweed, foxtail are no longer a large issue if we're using this as a system, system-based weed control, where we get some of the costs back. Some photos to illustrate this. Um, no pre-emergent herbicide versus pre. For today's talk, that's kind of irrelevant. We're not on a herbicide talk today, but what is relevant is look at the amount of weeds in the tillage system versus the no-till system. Pretty substantial. We start to incorporate the winter rye. Um, again, don't grow winter rye on every single one of your acres and plant corn into it the first year of cover cropping. That's like a year three thing. Take some time, learn that system. It's very simple. We don't use any complicated technology to do this. However, it did take a little bit of time to figure out what our planner needed to look like to do that. Um, and then our late termination, we're not recommending late termination for corn or soybeans um, unless you really want to build a lot of biomass out there. Just because there is, this last year, there was almost seven tons of rye biomass. I used to say the rye is as tall as I am when we terminate the late timing. 
this year is two feet taller than I was. I couldn't see in front of me in the plots. It was incredible. Um, early planted rye. Corn meal. This is 2019, 2020 corn meal at Arlington and Lancaster Research Farm. Every single one of these you see from Lancaster is a little bit of a dip. Whenever we incorporate cover crops or we incorporate a winter rye and tillage into the systems, we get that bump from the tillage. 2018 or 2019, 2020, we did. However, for soybean yield, they were always pretty well consistent. We never saw a yield reduction from no till or incorporating cover crops or soybeans. Where I always recommend farmers to start with soybeans. With corn, though, it takes a little bit of time. This is year three. We didn't think we'd see this. I don't have the data yet to show you. However, this is our tillage here. It was nothing to brag about. Our no-till year was very surprising to us. We had our winter rye, our planted green looked really well, um, and then our other treatments looked well. Why did this look so good this year? Why did our no-till after only three years and our um, cover crop fields look so good after only three years this year, this season? The water, it was dry. It was dry and we struggled to activate herbicides this year. That's where this residue really paid off. This year, we may see 20, 30 bushel differences in our corn yield in a positive direction. This even showed in our tillage with a pre-emergent herbicide, because again, that tillage and the herbicide weren't nearly as effective as they were in the past because it was dry. We really anticipate based on the literature and other farmers in the region telling us to keep sticking with this experiment, that we're gonna see pretty consistent results moving forward. This is from Arlington, very similar story, except for Arlington has some of the best soils in the world. And I say that growing up south of here where we had some of the best soils in the world, Arlington does as well. Very good soils and very consistent yields. Again, pretty anecdotal data. It's just one photo It's some years that I randomly picked. I didn't randomly pick the Arlington ones as a disclaimer, but we randomly picked these years, put them on the tailgate, took a photo of them with a tape measure, and you start to see those differences. You can also see the differences out in the field. We had to walk these plots for a field day in September. We were shocked at how crappy the corn was that we took. The corn was about my height. Very surprising. I could not believe it. I didn't think there'd be that big a difference. Some more data from Ted to back this up. We're going to skip ahead a few slides um, to the near end of this. Possible savings. We talked about long-term soil health benefits, water infiltration, cost of having all that capital tied up. This is an, an area that when I was running a landscape contracting business, I really tried to think more about. And that's every dollar you have when you invest in a piece of equipment is a dollar that you can't use somewhere else to buy another piece of equipment you might need, pay for a repair, pay off debt, or even invest in a, a long-term investment that may have better returns than our disc ripper does. Fall tillage costs us on average $29 an acre. Now I know that there's a custom guy maybe in the room today that will do that for 22. The true cost of owning an $80,000 piece of equipment with a $300,000 tractor to pull it and the labor in the fuel is going to be, according to the University of Illinois, which Philip, I guess, is our best data source for today, um, is $29 an acre. Spring tillage is $11 an acre. Planting $17 an acre. However, these systems on average, they're going to lose five tons per soil. When you look at SNAP Plus, three tons for use tillage. This is going to be spring field cultivation only, and one ton for no till. Our nutrients lost, think back to that slide we calculated out those nutrients, is $39 an acre for till, $23 for use till, and seven for no till. Our expenses equal $96.51 for $26, just for those three variables we identified in the slide. Bushels per acre, that means compared to no till, we better be growing 19 bushels per acre every single year to justify that when compared to the new center tillage. Now, there's probably places that we can justify tillage that will give us 19 bushels per acre when we have heavy compaction, made some bad decisions last season, but try to do that for 30 or 40, 60 years, um, it's gonna be difficult. So that means our no-till is gonna need 13.94 bushels less to still remain profitable Per acre. So yeah, we can grow 300, 350 bushels per acre corn. That's another talk, another day. But I would rather talk about how we can grow enough corn to pay for our expenses and have a nice paycheck at the end of the day. I prefer to sign the back of the paycheck than the front. 